live from ClickOrlando.com, this is News 6 at 5.30. This is a News 6 Plus takeover. Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Talk to Tom. This is the time I get to talk to the viewers at home. It's my favorite part of my job right now, talking to you, the viewer. We started this in 2004 during hurricane season with Hurricane Charlie. It grew into something I did on Facebook for a number of years, and it's blown up so much that their station decided to give us a shot. Every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, we take over the airwaves, the powerful WKMG, and we're always streaming on News 6 Plus. So you can, if you miss an episode, you can go back and stream them all. And frankly, I wish you would. Talk to Tom. All right. If you want to submit a question to me, just click Orlando.com is the place to go. Click Orlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Submit your question and we will get you on. I think we've got a great show that you're going to enjoy lined up for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about how weather impacts Florida's sea turtles and how our friends at the Bavard Zoo are working to help those turtles that are struggling. I love this, this story. You're going to see it in the second half of this Talk to Tom episode. But first, Talk to Tom. It's all about you, the viewer at home, and your questions. So let's jump in with our friend, Richard. Hey, Richard. What is dry lightning? I moved down here. Neighbors tell me about dry lightning. I'm out mowing my lawn on a beautiful sunny day, and then I'm told, oh, my God, get <clears> indoors. <throat> Didn't you hear that? It could kill you. Real or is it fake? <laughs> okay, it's not fake. Hey, first of all, man, welcome to Central Florida. You didn't say where you moved down here from. But wherever you were from, you had lightning storms too. Probably not what I like to call the voice of God thunderstorms that we have here in Central Florida, but you did have storms. Dry lightning is lightning that is normally associated with a thunderstorm that develops but doesn't produce rain. It's got enough uplift and a friction in the clouds that you end up with lightning strikes going out, but absent the rain. That's normally what we mean when we say this is a dry lightning storm. Lightning strikes are coming out of this thunderhead, but there's no rain falling yet. No discernible rain on radar. It could be a situation where the rain is evaporating, or it could be the storm has just not reached full maturity yet. It's already producing lightning, but no discernible precipitation. Now that does happen, and that's what is called dry lightning. Yes, it's real. Anytime you hear thunder, you should take cover. More about that in a moment. There's also a thing called heat lightning that I argue with people about all the time that's different from dry lightning. Dry lightning is lightning that happens. You can hear the rumbles of thunder and it's not raining. Heat lightning is what they used to call lightning way off in the distance from the heat of the day building thunderstorms. But they couldn't hear the thunder. They thought, I don't worry about it. It's just what, you know, it's heat lightning. It's the earth giving off the heat, popping lightning way far out. Well, that's true, but it's lightning. The only reason you can't hear it is because it's more than 10 miles away. Could it still hit you? Yeah, it still could. Most especially if it's maybe 12 miles away and the rumblings of thunder die out before they get to you. The lightning can still strike miles away from the parent thundercloud so you have to really be careful in central florida so the slogan is if you could see it you should flee it get inside take cover if you hear it you absolutely have to fear it if you can hear the thunder you're within eight miles of the lightning strike you could easily die anytime you hear a rumble of thunder take cover for at least 30 minutes that's the rule you hear rumbles of thunder get the kids out of the pool get them inside now um if you're a gambler and you want to gamble with your kid's life or your life or whatever, you can still gamble on that and stay outside in the lightning if you want to and probably won't get struck. But if you lose that bet, it's ugly. And for most people, there's no coming back from it. Um, I've interviewed lots of lightning uh, victims, and they all say that um, even if they aren't killed by the lightning strike, they end up wishing they were dead because it changes their life that much. It's just so bad to be struck by lightning and what it does to you. So be careful. All right, next question comes to us from our friend, Nancy. Um, I'm just wondering, like there's been a lot of warm weather um, up in New England, and uh, I have a friend that sent me pictures of the pussy willows already blooming. So my question would be, how does that affect 
uh, the plants and the foliage and everything else for the year? Does that have an effect if everything blooms early? Oh, that's a great question, and it's one of the problems with um, climate change. People always want to talk about climate change and get angry about, ah, the globe's not warming that much. Well, yeah, it is. It's warmed up a degree or two, and that's enough. And so what, what we have going on is not just a chance of global warming. It's what we call cases of global weirdness. And the weirdness is that we end up with very warm Januarys, sometimes warm Februarys, and you end up with a growing season that all of a sudden starts, and then there's an Arctic outbreak. So you didn't say where up north is. You said New England. But I promise you that February in New England's cold. And so they had a good run through December, January. Very little snow. New York City went almost the entire month of January with no snow before they got snow in February. And so it's been very weird. But then all of a sudden, first week of February, boom, Arctic outbreak, killing those pussy willows and all the blooms. I'm sure they're frozen. They're going to drop. It's going to make them have to start over, which would lead you to think that, A, they won't be as strong, and B, when they finally do come out, they won't bloom as much in the spring. It's going to make them weaker through this summer growing season, more likely than not. And it happens not only with, with pretty flowers and plants, it also happens with crops. You know, your winter wheat gets messed up if it's not cold enough and doesn't get enough snow out west. And then we don't have a chance to kill off the bugs and the parasites and ends up messing with all kinds of agriculture concerns if we don't get a true winter. And global change or climate change leads to the weirdness in that all of a sudden we go so many months and it's way too warm and then brutal, brutal cold fronts come through sometimes. And sometimes they don't. It's just really, really weird. So that's all part of the climate change. And yes, it does mess them up. Let's do, a, do our third question of the day. This one came to us via text from Text Amet, which is a cool item we have going on here at the Powerful KMG. You can learn more about Text Amet on ClickOrlando.com. Please go into ClickOrlando.com and search Text Amet. You can ask me a question that way too. And Candace Campos will also answer your question. She won't like, you know, chat with Candace, but she'll do a, a full right on answer to you. If you have a question for us, we'd love to answer it to you. So our friend Sophia and Satellite wants to know, how worried should we be beachside in Bavard County because of the rising water? Okay, um, if you've watched any of our newscast or pay attention to talk to Tom, I try to make you understand that climate change and global weirdness, as the previous question, is a real thing. Things are changing. I also want you to know that I'm not going to panic, and most people are not going to panic, and we're going to fight this, and we're going to win, and we're going to take it on. Uh, carbon capture is going to change the world and all of our big problems. But your question specifically is, it's not going to be easy to beat climate change, but we're going to fight back. I promise you it's happening in laboratories all across the country and around the world right now. Steps to battle climate change are happening. But your question is how concerned should we be? Yes, you should be concerned. Um, according to everything that we find, most of our research since about 1900, globally, we're up anywhere from two to six inches in rising water. And along our coast, we're going to rise about 0 0.05 inches every year for the next 10 to 15 years until we get a handle on this and start maybe cooling the climate a little bit more in the next 20 to 30 years as we slowly turn that ship on climate change. So yes, there's going to be rising water in Bavard County. We're going to have to re-nourish our beaches. We're going to think about building better seawalls, coming up with more dams, uh, more ways to keep the water back until we can get a handle on climate change and try to reverse things for the future generations. So that's the deal. You should worry. You should be concerned. I wouldn't panic because a rise of maybe two inches is not going to totally inundate all of Bavard County. It will lead to more beach erosion, more damage, more flooding at high tides, and more what we call um, combination flooding. So we'll have high tide, we'll have a little storm, and you get a bunch of flooding that you normally didn't used to get when the sea level was a lot lower. It'll be coming over the highways and flooding up the streets for a while during high tide hurricanes, things like that, nor'easters, pushing water up streams and across city streets that never happened before because of the rising waters. I wouldn't panic, but yes, in Bavard County, Felicia Flagler, I would be concerned, and I would do what I could to battle the problem. All right, that's going to wrap up this part of the show.
Coming up, first of all, if you have questions about the weather, you can submit them anytime. Click Orlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. And coming up in the second part of this show, we're going to be talking turtles. Stay with us. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talk to Tom. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. We answered your questions earlier. If you'd like to get a question answered, submit it to me. Click Orlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. I would love to hear from you. Right now, we want to talk about an important aspect of our weather and its impact on wildlife, most specifically turtles. Joining us now is Shanigan, the Sea Turtle Program Manager with the Brevard Zoo, to talk a little bit more about it. The Brevard Zoo says climate change, which you've heard me talk about, and we feature it every Thursday right here on the powerful KMG, is making the turtles more susceptible to disease. Shannon, first of all, welcome to Talk to Tom. And talk to me a little bit about what you guys are doing with the turtles and how they're susceptible to climate change. Well, thank you so much for having me um, and having our Sea Turtle Healing Center on your show. Um, one of the things that we most obviously see with this change in climate or um, change in weather, if we'd like to say it that way, with storms is that our beaches erode. Um, sea turtles um, use sandy beaches to lay their eggs. So if those sandy beaches are washed away, then that becomes a problem for our sea turtles. Sea turtles are a considered threatened and endangered species. And a lot of that is because where they, where their nesting grounds are in danger of being either unable, unable to be nested upon because there's no sand there, or it's because of pollution, trash. Um, that is in the way. Um, a lot of times people in some areas uh, bring in um, uh, like their lounge chairs or their beach tents and they leave them up because they're going to be there all weekend and they want to stake out their spot. Unfortunately, turtles nest and they, they get tangled up in those items um, oh, wow. and it doesn't work for the sea turtle. But we do, like you said, deal with the fibropapillomatosis virus. It's um, called it F is FP virus. for short. Yes, that, that's again. a very big word. So we do we do abbreviate. It's called fibropapillomatosis. Wow. So we call it FP for short. It mm -hmm. is a herpes virus that ha that does affect all species of sea turtles, but specifically our green sea turtles. Scientists believe that most likely these um, turtles, green turtles specifically, are impacted because of their food source. They are specialized eaters, and they eat seagrass and algae, and a lot of the runoff. Um, that we produce on land ends up in their food sources and causes them to become ill and maybe it causes them to express this disease. We do not know how they get it yet, um, but we are still working toward that and hoping to be able to create a cure instead of being reactive like we are here at the Healing Center. We're able, there are um, 18 facilities statewide throughout the state of Florida and eight of them can take sick and injured turtles that have that FP virus. Um, what we do in these facilities are remove those tumors on the outside of their bodies by cutting them off with either a, a, a hot pottery loop or we use a laser to cut them off. Tell me about this. You just said you do surgery on them, like traditional, we you do. give them like mm -hmm. painkiller and then slice them. Is that what yes. you do? Yes. Wow. We do. I don't. Our veterinary team does. <laughs> so I'm part of the veterinary team. Okay. Um, but we have two board certified zoo vets that work here at our zoo. And we have a veterinary intern who's learning zoo medicine. And they actually go in and they will remove those tumors. Sometimes the, the burden of tumors is so heavy on the animal that we end up having to do it in quadrants. Like we might do one front area or we might do just the rear end on a turtle at the first surgery and then wait until another time to do the second surgery or, or even third. Okay, so not only depends. they tell me that not only do you do laser treatments, you also do some mm -hmm. cool new age type of um, <laughs> kind of treatments like like honey or like like leeches to draw blood out or maybe even maggots. Is that right? That is right. And it isn't actually new age. It's been around for a long time. So even back in Egyptian times, yeah, I would say it's more, it's more like um, this right. all. It's kind of like yeah. woo woo science. It's, it's, it's like a throwback. You see people <laughs> in the medieval movies, right. the middle aged movies, putting leeches on. Right. But it works right, for your right. turtles? So, bloodletting, it does. So, the maggots actually help to clean and debride wounds that maybe um, would be um, really difficult to go in, go in and surgically debride or cause a lot of bleeding if we surgically debrided them. So, we use leeches, I'm sorry, uh, maggots for that. 
Wow. The leeches help often with turtles that have entanglement issues. So if fishing line is wrapped tight around a flipper, we can put the leech on that on the side of the flipper and help to draw out some of the fluid that's in there, and it will promote wow. circulation and and help the help that hip, flipper heal a little bit faster, hopefully. Um, and then we also use honey as well. We did honey. We do light um, a cold light therapy, which actually helps. It's kind of like back, going back to school, um, the mitochondria in the cells, like biology 101. So it helps the mitochondria kind of kick in and start working in those cells and help to um, bring uh, a lot of nutrients to the area that needs to be healed. Do you also so. take them to local hospitals for care? We do. Right now, we do not have a CT machine, but we are blessed to have that coming our way. We ju they just laid one of the pads, one of the final pads for it. Um, okay. We're under construction to get that CT machine, but we are lucky to pair with um, a Stewart Hospital, which is the Rockledge Regional Medical Center. And we mm -hmm. are so blessed that they allow us to come in and bring our sea turtles in and other animals in if oh. we need to for CT. That's awesome. I had, so. I've never heard of a hospital x-raying ct isn't it that's, great or yeah or ct well they're ct awesome. yes yeah, so it's right. amazing so yeah the, the team over there is phenomenal okay talk to me about what what do you mm -hmm. feed these turtles you bring them in from the ocean what do, what do you feed them right so what we do here at the brevard zoo and most facilities actually have to kind of change up their what they get fed um because we every sea turtle is a specialized eater so our green sea turtles and loggerhead sea turtles are predominantly what we see here um, and they're small green turtles that we normally see. So we offer both of them a variety of shrimp, uh, fish, and um, clams. The clams are already nice. shelled. Um, as our as our loggerheads start feeling better, then we'll give them the shells as well because they would eat those in the wild. Oh, do they really? Um, and then, cool. yeah, and then sometimes we end up with sea turtles that might not feel so good. So I do want to share one of my patients with you right now. If yeah, I can. please show me a turtle. We're running out of time. I want to see right a big here. turtle. Yeah. This is a wee one. This is not a big one. So oh. this right here is opal. Opal is only about two kilograms. And you can see opal has, a, this is a juvenile green sea turtle. And opal has a little feeding tube right here. So oh. it goes into the side of the mouth. Opal won't eat on their own. So we're having to administer food through the tube. How old is so opal again? How, how old is opal? Opal, I would have to estimate, but I would think Opal's probably three or four years old, maybe. Okay, okay. Probably. So what we're going to do is Opal's going to receive an injection, and this okay. is called metroclopramide, and it's actually just a quick injection. And we're, what we're doing with this is this turtle had, unfortunately, had a pretty bad um, uh, infection with uh, or infestation of a protozoan in their GI tract. So... <sighs> What we had to do for this turtle was get rid of those little bugs. We call it, you know, the little wee beasties that were making her feel, are making them not feel so good. And now we're trying to rebuild that GI mucosa wow. with a lining by giving them medication. And it's going to look kind of silly because I'm going to put this little turtle in a burrito wrap. Because <laughs> I want the turtle to sit up for this. Oh. And I'm going to use my hands and use this tube. And I, we're using something called sulfate, and it looks a lot like Pepto Bismol for turtles and other animals. But so we're going to go ahead and you're put force this feeding in it. The tube. Boom. Oh, it's going in the tube I'm right into it. I'm not forcing it. It's going right into the tube. <laughs> okay. And this should help Opal to. Oh. Um, it'll coat Opal's stomach a little bit. Yeah. But I want Opal to be all the way up. I push just a little bit of air through there to let it go through. And now we're going to let Opal kind of sit up and let the gravity do wow. some work. So, so Opal, why this, why is, this goes? This how many times a day do you have to do this for Opal? We are doing this right now three times a day for Opal. Wow! So Opal needs the nutrition because Opal's not maintaining weight on their own. So we do sit with Opal a few times a day, and we are very blessed here at the Healing Center because we only have two paid. Um, people who actually are dedicated working with sea turtles, but we have a, an army of volunteers that help us. And I can't tell you how nice it is to see our, see our sweet volunteers holding this little turtle up for us for five minutes, two or three times a day. Thank you so much. I'm going to wrap this up now. That is Shannon, our friend from the Bavard Zoo. If you have any questions you'd like to have answered here on Talk to Tom, go to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Submit your questions. I'd love to know what you want to know. You can catch us here every Thursday at 530 and always streaming on News 6 Plus.